Hello, welcome to my talk about Kubernetes configuration management. Um, it's a beginner level uh, talk, so uh, the target audience uh, would be someone who has heard of uh, Kubernetes and hasn't used it that much yet. So my name is Klaus Atesberger. I'm working at Bearing Point Technology in Graz at the Schwarzelsee. And my Twitter handle is Psychedelic Dad, if you want to follow me. Um, yeah, let's start. Uh, the talk description says, uh, this talk will give a short overview over the pro problem space and current options to manage configuration changes. Uh, but today, I do not want to be that negative uh, and focusing on problems. Instead, I would like to start with uh, what I like about Kubernetes. Kubernetes um, is uh, very good at handling stuff declarative. So uh, we tell Kubernetes uh, what we want to have. We want to have things uh, deployed in our infrastructure. And uh, we tell Kubernetes uh, with my favorite command, uh, kube control apply, that it just uh, should be as I say. <laughs> and uh, it feels a lot like make it so. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the, the it, it makes a, a great feeling when we just describe one, what we want to have. And um, that's it, Kubernetes handles the rest. So I want to show you a short example uh, of how we do this in Kubernetes. This is a so-called manifest file. It's YAML syntax, which is a superset of JSON. Uh, and yeah, uh, YAML is everywhere nowadays. And uh, some people like it, some people love, hate it, and some people just hate it. <laughs> Um, I'm in a transition in between, I, I, I would say. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so this is an example uh, for um, an object of, of the type, or as in Kubernetes we say, uh, of the kind uh, deployment. Uh, every manifest file looks something like this. You can uh, define here the API version uh, on which it depends, and uh, this is the, the kind. Uh, so it's, it's the type of the, the object that we are describing, and the rest is standard configuration. Uh, some of these uh, um, key, keys uh, you would see in, in any of those manifest files, for example, metadata, spec, uh, and, and labels, everything in Kubernetes can have labels, which is very useful. Yeah, that's just the first uh, small example. So, uh, we said we declare stuff, then something magical happens, and now the state is as we desired. Um, yeah, this, this magical stuff is called controllers. And uh, this is a short, uh, a small picture, uh, very simplified, of um, which way this information goes. Um, so, we have this Kubernetes cluster here, uh, the great box. Uh, where is my mouse? <laughs> um, and we interacted with it with uh, kube control and feeding it uh, specs, our desired state, our description of the desired state. Uh, one example we just have seen. So we feed it this uh, desired state, and there is a controller that watches the desired state and changes the changes that we make to it. And it also analyzes what the current state within our Kubernetes cluster and any difference between uh, is the responsibility of this uh, piece of code, which is the controller. Examples for this would be uh, an endpoint controller, service account controller, um, replica set controller, a replication contro controller, and um, if I, for instance, uh, increase 
the number of replications that I want to, want to have of my pod, the smallest unit that I can deploy or uh, handle within Kubernetes. When I increase the, the replication count of, of one pod and uh, the controller listens to this and it gets this information and, and says, okay, uh, now is the de desired state uh, is replication two instead of one. The current state is one replication, so I just start in another uh, pod and that's it. So, yeah, and there are different kinds of controllers and I just wanted to introduce you to this idea because it's very, uh, very, very central to Kubernetes. Um, yeah. So, a short recap on declarative config. Um, we forget about how, because that's the controller's job. Uh, and we also uh, forget about the parts and the infrastructure of our cluster. We, we don't know about nodes or stuff like that, usually. <laughs> um, and we manipulate the state by declaration of our desired state. Um, you can also uh, do some imperative-ish stuff with kube control. I wanted to show you some examples. Um, you could use uh, the rather imperative command kube control run to uh, inject a desired state without uh, configuring or writing a manifest file on your uh, disk beforehand or in your repository. Um, I would not recommend that. <laughs> I, I would recommend the last command. So uh, everything you should need to know about configuring your Kubernetes cluster is this one sole command. Um, that's it. <laughs> so let's move on. Um, what we gain by doing so is, um, yeah, we have the declarative approach, which by itself is a great uh, perk. Um, and we can use the same workflows as we do it everywhere else. Um, we we can just uh, make pull requests and, and do code reviews on our configuration. It's very uh, it's very um, strict and, 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 and clean um, and and yeah, it's very descriptive uh, to to handle the desired set with this manifest files. Um, sounds doable, right? So we just write the app, we describe its parts using Kubernetes objects, and then we apply this config by running kube control apply. But <laughs> uh, we will we will see rather uh, well, rather quickly that um, even small apps uh, will um, need, re will require quite a few lines of code of configuration. I used uh, the, the CLOG command, which is a very cool command to, to count the lines of code within a project. Uh, it also reports uh, which language uh, has how many lines of codes. In our case, it's <laughs> pure YAML. And we need 895 lines of code to describe uh, how one microservices demo uh, needs to be deployed. Uh, maybe some of you know already the microservices demo. Um, maybe I can see some hands. Ah, okay, no one knows it. Uh, <laughs> you should Google it. It's very cool. It's uh, maintained by uh, the company Weflux, I think, and of course the open source community. It's a great project to tinker with when you um, just need some example configure uh, example application um, that you want to um, apply on various uh, environments. Yeah. Um, so uh, even a small single application has very much uh, very many uh, uh, lines of codes. So what if we need to deploy stages? So what I'm thinking of is uh, multiple instances of our application uh, with slightly different configuration. So 
we got this 900 lines of code. I hope you don't have this uh, impulse to copy paste 900 lines of code. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, and, and of course we, we, we could find ourselves in the situation where we need customizations of our product. And uh, yeah, every time this happens, uh, we could end up having like the, something like this, uh, <laughs> which is only two stages and three customizations. And we got quite a lot of duplication sitting there. And um, yeah, um, but of course, uh, it's not the first time we encountered this. Uh, we had situ situations like this before. Uh, but my point here is, don't repeat yourself and now get to the solutions. Um, one solution we already know uh, are templates. Uh, Maybe you used uh, template engines like the Go template engine or the Chinja template engine or uh, anything else that comes to your mind. And uh, what, what are templates? Uh, a template is a modification of the original source. You put in placeholders and you need to feed it with values, uh, specifically key value pairs. So the template engine knows where to put your values within the original source. So step one, modify the original source code or configuration in our case. Uh, step two, you need to provide variations of your key value uh, pairs to, to feed into your templates in order to be able to render your resulting configuration that you're needing. So which tools uh, have we at hand for Kubernetes? The most popular and uh, the, the most easiest, I'd say, is Helm. It's, uh, it's propagated as a package manager. Um, I, I don't think of it as a package manager because actually it is uh, a templating tool. It uses Go templates and it packages <laughs> your templates with the value files. In this case, it's actually a package manager, okay. <laughs> so a second uh, tool that's, that's um, not that popular, but uh, I think it's almost as useful in, 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 and has its, um, its use cases where it's even better, is Capitan. Uh, it's a combination of an inventory engine called Reclass and um, um, making use of JSON and Chinja 2 and Cadet templating technologies. So JSON is rather complicated, I'd say. It's not that simple like Go template engines. JSON is actually propagated as a templating language. So uh, <laughs> maybe we start with Go templates. <laughs> So here's an example using uh, an, uh, an, a Helm template example, which is part of a Helm chart, which is the term for the packaging of templates with value files. So what we see here is uh, we, we might uh, um, we might want to have a very flexible chart like this one, where almost Every single line has a uh, <laughs> um, a placeholder, and um, essentially we we will need to feed this template a value file uh, that consists of uh, a, a flattened representation of the original uh, manifest file. So, um, at some point when we <laughs> on every single line have a placeholder. Uh, it, it is more like, uh, I don't like this manifest syntax. I, I'd, I'd rather have uh, flattened out key value pairs. <laughs> uh, and this is, in my opinion, a bad practice. So um, there, there is always uh, trade-offs. Uh, we need to uh, balance um, how flexible a Helm, temp a Helm template uh, should and can be. Uh, and balance it uh, against 
how, how useful uh, or how uh, useful it is in, in regards of uh, reducing code duplication. So mm, we, we moved to an example soon. So I wanted to show you a short uh, example with the Git service. Who knows Git? Okay, uh, that should be way more hands. Uh, Git is a very cool uh, Git repository manager. And um, this is the configuration, um, or the, the tree of the configuration files. So, and this part from here down. So we have a, a values file and an example value file. And these are the components. Uh, which are templates, and so in this example, we're seeing this this template is very flexible. <laughs> um, a better example would be uh, the microservices demo that I mentioned before, the provider uh, Helm chart 2. So in this example we see we've got way less uh, placeholders. Maybe we would find ourselves in the future with, um, with the requirement to add more placeholders. This might actually be a real use case because there uh, are certain hard-coded resource limits configured for this service. Um, and yeah, it's always trade-offs. Um, I just wanted to show you uh, that the longer such a, a chart exists, the more flexible it gets naturally, and uh, essentially that leads to uh, having a values file that's as long as the original file, but with less syntax. It's, mm, yeah. So the downsides of templating, um, we need to template or change the manifest files. Uh, which is work, uh, but it's not the, the, the real downside that I'm uh, thinking of when, I, when I'm telling you this, because uh, when we change the template, uh, when we change the manifest files, uh, we, uh, we lose the, the, um, the ability to easily upgrade once we um, discover that the original manifest files uh, got developed uh, to a new version or something like that. And we need to provide the values. And as I uh, said before, once we... Ah, you don't see anything. <laughs> um, and as I, said, as I said before, once we... Um, once a project gets a, a bit of age, um, we, we duplicate the code within the value files, which is a bad practice, in my opinion. So don't repeat yourself. Easy upgrades. Um, yeah. And a, a third term that I wanted to mention here is uh, inventory. So uh, we have already, you, we might have already experience with uh, tools like Ansible or Puppet or the likes. Um, they have all uh, some kind of um, uh, ability to, to handle the configuration that makes your application instance special. So uh, it reduces uh, these valued files to um, the essence of difference that it has to the original uh, configuration. So it's not that bloaty and it's, it, it actually um, reduces the code or the configuration needed to the essence that is uh, required to 
uh, make the distinction that that is makes your instance special. So templates help with the, uh, the, the don't repeat yourself thing with the original manifest files. We don't need to uh, copy them as a whole, uh, but we lose in, in this process um, the easy upgrade feature. And some tools help us with the inventory to reduce the value files um, that we've seen before. So there are different kinds of apps and workflows, uh, essentially two. Um, one is uh, bespoke apps. Bespoke apps are apps that you build yourself and um, this term is originating from the clothing industry where you tailor a suit, it's a bespoke suit uh, when you took measure with the tailor. Um, and the second category is common off the shelf apps, which would be something like uh, CI server like Jenkins or a Atlassian product like Jira, Confluence and so on. Um, and um, they, are, they, they have different workflows in this context because in common off the shelf apps, there is already a configuration that evolves with the version of the product. And in bespoke apps, we handle the source code and the configuration to deploy it uh, ourselves. And uh, we never find ourselves in the situation of upgrading our customization uh, to the new version that uh, got released upstream from the third party. So this is a huge difference uh, in handling the configuration. So this looks lo something like this uh, in, the, in the case of, uh, of the shelf apps. So we got a Helm chart. This is the green bar at the, at the top. And we fork this Helm chart for our own purposes. So uh, maybe in the original Helm charts, the, there weren't that many uh, placeholders within the templates as we needed to make our uh, application deployment. And so we forked it, but uh, every single time we want, to, we want to upgrade to a new version that got released upstream, we need to reconcile this update with upstream and our changes. And we over and over apply the same development changes that we've got in our repository and need to resolve those conflicts. So that's quite some work. The better approach would be uh, if we had uh, the ability to just patch these files without changing them to uh, templates that we use. So we just use the, the upstream um, files and, and, and don't change them. And we change the values within these files without actually templating uh, or adding uh, additional placeholders in the original files. So what I want to say is don't fork, patch. Uh, and uh, I, I shamelessly steal this uh, picture from uh, a product called Ship. It's a, it has an open source core, but also uh, propri proprietary uh, parts. Um, yeah. It depicts uh, basically what I'm talking about. So on the left side, we have a Helm chart and custom values that represent the uh, resulting configuration that we want to apply. Um, and on the right side, we, uh, we define this, uh, this, this chart as a base, a base configuration, and define some patches. Um, and the result is the configuration that we actually want to deploy on our systems. So what's the tool to do something like this? The tool is called Customize. So it's a magical thing again. Uh, it's templating without placeholders. And Customize, then that is because Customize knows where to put the values itself. We don't need to tell it Customize, it knows itself. So. Uh, Customize has some sort of uh, DSL uh, feeling uh, when using it, so, um, but it's not that complicated. So this, isn't te this ain't template thing, <laughs> but I don't care. <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> um, yeah, um, a short demo.
So um, before I show you the code, uh, <laughs> um, we got in this part uh, the original chart, which are templates and the components and the value files. And um, I can use uh, Helm to generate manifest files from this Helm chart, uh, which doesn't include any uh, placeholders anymore. So now I uh, generated these files within the folder base. I hope you can see this. And um, besides this base folder, I need to provide some folders for, uh, for overlays. Uh, that's a term in customized. So we define patches for the dev stage and for the prod stage and um, each overlay needs a customization YAML file and in this customization YAML files I define which are my bases. I could have multiple but in our case it's, it's one base and uh, I define also the patches that I want to add to this configuration. So in this file, uh, in, in this case I had have prepared something So I defined uh, the base, uh, which is relative to this um, overlay, and I defined uh, to add a special label customization with the value def to all of the components. Um, and I wanted to have uh, the HTTP and SSH services within this chart to use um, a different, a slightly different configuration. So I specifically wanted to have uh, a different type of service. I wanted to change the type of service to NodePod instead of cluster IP. And yeah, that, that's it. Uh, so if I want to deploy this to my uh, Minikube, So I, I still have my, my old uh, deployment running. I could just attempt to change the files and deploy a different instance.
I should have a running instance. So we see I have two Git services running. <laughs> and if I query, for instance, the HTTP services, Okay, <laughs> um, rather complicated. <laughs> um, yeah, um, this is my GT running in my Minikube cluster. Um, so the patch tools that we could use in our workflow uh, are customized, of course. Helm template, as we've seen, to generate manifest files that contain um, no placeholders. And we could use a tool called chip. I mentioned it shortly before. Chip um, um, automates the detection and preparation of updates. So it listens to the upstream and listens to um, releases. Uh, on the upstream side, and once it detects an, an update that you can uh, rebase to, it uh, notifies you and uh, tells you, okay, there uh, there is an update, and and it also creates a pull request within your repo, um, and you could review the changes and just apply it, and that's it. Um, it's really cool. So um, we got two different workflows that I wanted to mention. So one is for the bespoke configuration workflows, where we do not have any upstream repository that we depend on. And uh, the developer just uh, commits and tags within your own repository. And um, uh, he iterates on, on, on the versions by adding changes uh, mostly to the base configuration. Uh, you should always uh, aim to put as much uh, as possible into the base configuration to reduce uh, code duplication within your dif uh, different instances. And uh, you could have a bot that just uh, listens to your changes and automatically applies any changes that you commit to your Git repository. And voila, you have, uh, you have GitOps. Um, the workflow using a common off-the-shelf application and keeping it up to date is slightly different. As I've said before, you have an upstream repository and fork it. And um, the developer now needs to uh, make changes to the fork and uh, I hope way more often to the uh, to your own uh, repository using uh, overlays and usually it's the same repository uh, but you could uh, use subkit or something like this um, yeah, and uh, you work with pull requests uh, on your configuration, and uh, once you uh, notice that upstream has an update for you, you could rebase on um, on the new version. So this is depicted here. Occasionally rebase your fork to be up to date with the upstream, and the rest is is uh, quite the same as before. You could have a bot that listens to your 
uh, pushes to your repository and applies it to your Kubernetes clusters. So that's it. Any questions? Mind blown. No one asks questions. I, I could ask myself a question <laughs> if you're interested. Um, um, how many of you know have heard of, of operators in Kubernetes? Okay, uh, then this doesn't make any sense to ask for it. <laughs> any questions? Yeah, this. The question was, uh, um, how do you do resource management in Kubernetes? Yeah. Okay. Um, So this is an, an example. Uh, I guess you're referring to this example that, because I've shown it before. Um, you simply uh, write a spec for, uh, this is a deployment uh, manifest file. So a deployment manifest file um, is, is very similar to, um, it's, it's a configuration for the replication controller. And the replication controller is responsible to uh, schedule workloads. And your workloads on Kubernetes are pods. And pods consist of Docker containers. So this is the unit uh, where this gets uh, configured. So it's actually a, um, a C group configuration on the container level. And you know, Kubernetes handles this for you. <laughs> Pardon me? He uh, handle, for example, if I, if I provide, uh, ask for too much resources, is he smart to, enough to, uh, to stop the process, for example, if too many resources would I be worked? I think your task would not get scheduled. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, and one more question. What yeah. does the, the replicas mean? The first the parameter space. Um, uh, I al already mentioned it in the talk. Uh, yeah. Replicas is uh, the, the number of replications of one container. So if, okay. uh, if you want to scale your uh, static site hosting web server and uh, um, want to have two, three, 
or more uh, replications of your okay, yeah. code, then it st schedules that many. So this can't be changed on runtime, for example, if... Of course, it can be changed, okay. but you should not mix up uh, um, the the technique w with which you configuring your desired state. So okay. you should not uh, handle the desired state on the one hand uh, by uh, curating your manifest files and on the mm -hmm. other hand uh, mixing it up with uh, something more dynamic like an operator. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, that that's uh, a thousandth part of one uh, CPU. Uh, it's it's actually a, a almost a third CPU, so to say. <laughs> of a virtual CPU, as a um, yeah, it's. Uh, It, it's the core that the operating system uh, sees when you are uh, listing them. So it's one virtual core, uh, regardless of what uh, underlying hardware you have that results in this core. Any more questions? <laughs>